Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming uh, to this um, session of the Council on Aging presentations that I do here in Southborough at the Senior Center, and thank you to the Senior Center folks for inviting me. My name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I do nothing but elder law. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us, so when I moved there, it was great because I don't, no longer have to try to figure out anything else. I just do elder law, and if they've got elder law questions from their clients, then they come to me. So this is kind of all I do. Um, what I decided for this year, because uh, I've been doing presentations here, I think at the Senior Center for about five years now, what I decided for this year is that the first two of these, I would try to focus on what I'll call topics of general interest, which I'm calling Elder Law 101 and Elder Law 102. Um, this is 101. And this is about issues that you would face if you were slowing down, if you are retiring, about to retire, already retired for a while, and you're saying you're still, you're not in crisis mode right now, but you don't want to be either in the future. And so it's talking about all of those things. And Elder Law 102, which I'll be doing I think next month, um, we're talking about benefits. It's all of the benefit, all the programs that you can uh, um, qualify for, especially if your interest, like my friends Frank and Frank and Mary, whom you've seen before, Frank and Mary, and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. I always love that, because I always tell people, I can always tell my clients, because they get that joke. You know, the younger one's like, oh, what? What did he say? Um, so the Elder Law 102 is really about all the benefits you can apply for, especially if, you, if your goal, like Frank and Mary, is to stay at home. Uh, then for the fall, I'm going to do two more kind of specific presentations on topics that are um, more advanced. And I'd be interested in your suggestions on those because I haven't picked them yet. But if there are particular issues that you don't think you know enough about, but you just have a feeling that you should, I'd be interested. I'm glad to do a presentation. One of the ones that I think I, I want to do, at least in some communities, is one that deals with folks who have got Social Security checks and also one of the spouses is a public employee or was. So there's this, there's this thing about how much retirement do you get and how does Social Security connect with this and what happens if you die and how, you know, there's all that stuff. I'm going to try to do one of those. I was going to do one, one on Medicare because I was trying to figure that out myself. I turned 65 in January and I was embarrassed as an elder law attorney. I was like, I'm on this website saying, how does this work again? You know, it was really embarrassing. So anyway, uh, Elder Law 101. This is about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. And they have very simple goals. Um, they want to die and be buried in the backyard. Um, and live in their house until they die, and then, when they, and then if one dies, they want to leave everything to the surviving spouse. They want to take care of their spouse. Most people will tell me they're not worried about themselves, at least in most marriages. They're mainly worried about their spouse. You know, oh, I want to make sure my spouse is safe, right? Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit, and there are their, and, and there are their assets. Um, they own a house, just a little house, right? Because in South Broad, this is a little house, right? It's $300,000. They have an IRA worth 150. Uh, they have a, an annuity worth about 100. They've got a bank accounts worth about 75. It all totals, I think, about 625. Um, Frank is on Social Security making 1,500 a month, and then he gets a pension for 500. So he's making 2,000 a month. Uh, Mary is making 750, which is half of Frank's. By the way, which always leads to that interesting comment, just kind of in parentheses. It amazes me when I see clients who are both retired like this. How many people don't realize? That the, client with the, that the client with the smaller um, check is always entitled to, the, the, with the smaller Social Security check, if they both worked, is always entitled to take either that amount or an amount equal to 50% of what the other spouse gets. So I just had a client come in, and these new people, and one, the husband was making $1,800 a month, and the wife was getting a check for $500. And I said, how come she's only getting a check for $500? Oh, well, she didn't work that much, you know, and so... 
the Social Security said that she's just entitled to the 500. I said, well, no, but you can actually take half of your husband's, which is 900, and then when your husband dies, then you get his, you get the higher number. So I just mentioned this because these are being televised. A lot of times these presentations are for the people who don't come, really, who are in their house and they don't come to these. Uh, they're not as active, they may not be as well informed, and so they may just be losing money. So um, um, if, you're, if, they, if you're them, then the question which often comes to me from folks who are retiring and trying to figure out is what documents do I really need? I really need a will, right? And what about trusts? Well, the first thing that you need to know is that you, as far as wills, you may not need another will. You may not need a will at all. If you're Frank and Mary and your goal is to, is to make sure that if one of you dies, the other one gets everything, and when the two of you have died, everything gets divided up. Well, that's exactly what the law says happens if you don't have a will. It didn't used to be that way, actually. It changed a couple of years ago. It used to be that if, if Frank died and Mary was still alive, she didn't get everything, actually. She had to split things with the kids. Um, but that got changed. So if that's your situation, in general, you don't need a will, but don't, having a will, doesn't that mean you avoid probate? Well, no. The point of the probate process is to make sure that anything that is just in your name at the time of your death goes through probate so that we can all figure out who gets it. Because if you owned it, and there's, and there's, and there's, then, then no one owns it at the moment of your death uh, unless there's this probate process to figure it out. Now, if you don't have a will, then Basically, the Commonwealth has written a will for you, and the will says, among other things, if you're Frank and Mary, that the, if one dies, it all goes to the spouse, and after that, it gets divided among the kids. So if you're comfortable with that will, you don't need another one. To the extent that you don't like those rules, though, then you do need a will. Now, it may be that you want one. I, I typically tell people you want to think about two different kinds of cases as to whether or not you need a will. One is the kids. Do one of your kids have one of these three problems? Either they've got a creditor issue. This is like the poet that you had, you know, the free thinking, but oh my God, they owe a lot of money, right? Because do they have a creditor issue? Because you don't want to die and inadvertently leave the money to the kids' creditors, which is what happens if they get it, because then the creditors all have a claim against it. Second, is there one of those, is there that daughter-in-law or son-in-law that you never liked in the first place, and, they're not, and the marriage isn't going that great because you really don't want them to get something, right? But of course, if you die and leave assets to Peter or Paul or Mary uh, Jr., then, then, and that person then gets a divorce, those assets may come into play in terms of figuring out how the assets get divided up. The third is, do you have a child that you think either is on or will need government benefits like MassHealth, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Because if you, if, if for them to qualify for programs that are asset based, uh, they need to typically show that they're broke. So if you leave them a lot of assets, the effect of that may be that you're disqualifying them for government programs that may worth, be worth more than the assets you were going to give them. Now in all three of those cases, what you probably want to do, or what Frank and Mary would do, is if they had one child where they were concerned about the spouse, they would leave that child's share in trust for, that, for the benefit of that child. Typically, they'd name one of the other kids as the trustee. As long as that trustee is not obligated to distribute funds to that child, then that child's spouse cannot ask a probate judge to require the distribution, and therefore those assets won't be in play. Same thing with creditors. As long as the assets are in trust for the benefit of the child, the creditors can't force that child to get the money because the child doesn't have the right to it, right? Now, this only works, of course, if you have, if the kids get along, because you don't want this to just be causing fights among your kids, uh, and if, the, you can trust, if you can trust the kids. So often I'll tell people, if you've got a child in one of those categories, um, oh, and by the way, the, the final one, same, same thing, if that you think that child may be already on government benefits, if they're on SSI, uh, social Supplemental Security Income, if they're on MassHealth, um, then, then you would put the money in trust for them. There's no look back period or anything regarding that trust. If, the, if, if you die and, you're, and the will says the assets go in trust, the assets are immediately safe for the benefit of that child and that child will never have to count those assets to qualify for a government benefit and there will be no lien on those assets following his death. Okay, so often I'll suggest to people, especially in the creditor and the tough spouse category, just have your kids, just ask your kids. 
Just ask your kids. Say, you know, we was do I was doing my will and we were going to leave everything to you, but, you know, you got these issues, <laughs> you know, or you've got tax liabilities. This is what happens, right? Oh, my God, you know, the, you owe the IRS $50,000 and they're still kind of chasing you. Well, if you put the money in trust for their benefit, that money's not touchable by the IRS. The IRS is just another creditor, okay? So that's one. The other, which we're going to talk about a little later on, is if you, if you are concerned about nursing home issues and you want to protect your spouse in the event that you die and she or he needs to qualify for mass health for some, or, for, or for various other programs, then you'd want to put the assets in trust for their benefit in order to keep those assets from being countable. It's the same thing as how, what, how you dealt with, the, with your children. But we're going to talk about that one a little bit more. So, you don't really need a will as long as you're like in the Frank and Mary situation. What you have to have is you have to deal with these three things. Um, a health care proxy, everybody knows what that is, a power of attorney, and a MOLST. How many, raise your hands, how many people know what a MOLST form is? Oh yeah, oh, they're not many, right? So the, the MOLST form, the medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, which we'll talk about a little later, is now replacing the so-called DNR, the do not resuscitate form which was always referred to as the comfort care form. I never got why they called it the comfort care form. But anyway, it was like, don't resuscitate me. But we're going to talk about that a little later on. What I always tell people is, you know, the thing about estate taxes and, you know, all this other stuff, that only happens after you're dead, right? But while you're alive, you want to make sure that if you're incapacitated, somebody can deal with your assets and somebody can make medical decisions for you because that affects you. You know, after you're dead, you're dead. I've heard a lot of theories about what happens after you die, but in none of them are you especially worried about your kids at that point. You're just dead, you know. Um, you may be reincarnated, you may be in heaven, but you're definitely dead. But, but, but while you're alive, you want to make sure this stuff gets covered. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. First of all, health care proxies. I understand you may have heard all of this. Once again, this is for you. This is also for the folks back home. So just a couple of things. Two witnesses are required to do a health care proxy. Uh, uh, they cannot be people who are working in a nursing home a health, or a health facility unless they are also related to you by blood. Um, the, the purpose of the health care proxy is to allow the person whom you name as your agent. Technically, you're not naming a proxy. The proxy is the document through which you name this agent who is going to act for you. The health care proxy only comes into effect if the doctor has said, if the doctor has said in writing, um, that, that you are unable to make medical decisions, at which point um, that person can make all medical decisions for you. Um, the, the decision as to whether or not you need to be admitted to a nursing home is a medical decision, right? Uh, I, uh, this issue gets raised. Um, all of my clients, just about all of my clients are either worried about Alzheimer's or they have Alzheimer's or their relatives have Alzheimer's. So we hear about these issues a lot. So, the good news for you, if you don't want to go to a nursing home, is that even if you've said that your daughter or your son um, has your proxy, if they say that you want to go, into, go to that nursing home and you get to the nursing home and you say, I don't want to go, even if the doctor has said that you can't make a medical decision, your saying that amounts to a revocation of the health care proxy and the, health, and the nursing home won't take you, right? That's the good news. You're still safe, even if you've done a health care proxy. Of course, the bad news is if someone's given you the health care proxy and now they've kind of lost it and you want to get them to a nursing home and you're afraid that they will object. And I'm telling you that while it is very, very seldom, this very seldom happens, if they do object, the nursing home, if they're paying attention and don't want the legal liability, will say, sorry, we're not taking them. And you need to get a court order before that person will get admitted to the nursing home. So you should be aware of that. When you have a health care proxy, you can always reject somebody's advice for medical treatment, including admission to a nursing home, and that has the legal effect of revoking the health care proxy. Uh, who should the health care proxy be? Now, often, typically, when a sp spouses come in, they'll say, oh, we're just going to name each other. And that sounds like the sensible thing. And it is the sensible thing, except I just want to bring up one thing. So as you're getting older, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of clients who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. As you're getting older, if your spouse is in the hospital and you're going through this kind of major medical event, where do you want to be spending your time? With your spouse or reading all the medical reports and talking to the doctor and consulting with the nurse and blah, 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 right? The, for my clients, typically the answer is the former, not the latter. 
right? If that's the case, then you may want to consider if you have a designated, I always, it's inevitably a designated daughter, right? But sometimes there's a son. Usually there's somebody, in, if you've got kids, there's one of them that's kind of like the one you're going to count on, right? Not always the case. And it's usually a girl. You know, boys are usually terrible at this stuff, but not always the case, right? But if you've got that person, name them as the proxy, in, the, in your proxy as your agent. That way, if your spouse is in the hospital, you can be with your spouse. Of course, your son or your daughter is not going to like order a medical treatment without talking to you about it, right? But that way, you don't have the stress of it. So I just mentioned that. Oftentimes, um, any, if you leave any instructions in the healthcare proxy, like, oh, if I'm in a vegetative state, uh, I don't want any extraordinary measures taken. Uh, if there's a line like that, or there, I've seen them in many of them, if I cannot recognize people and cannot have a coherent conversation, um, then I don't want any extraordinary measures. Extraordinary measures often are defined as like things like blood transfusions. It's not just resuscitation, it's you know, serious. First, you should know that all those instructions, are, none of them are legally binding. None of them are legally binding. There is no um, such thing as a legally binding living will, so to speak, in Massachusetts, or an advanced directive signed by you that anybody has to pay any attention to. So you should just be aware of that. Second, when, when you're talking to your kids about this, or your spouse, you know, about kind of what you want, you may want to put something in writing to them, especially to the kids, so that if the, the one you've named doesn't end up getting a lot of grief from the other ones, you know, if they're making a decision, they're just saying, you know, this isn't my idea, this was Ma, this is what Ma wanted to do, you know. But when you're thinking about these kinds of instructions, you know, if I'm in a vegetative state, don't do anything, especially if, I'm in a, if, I, if I can't recognize people and stuff, don't do anything. Really think, of, you want to really think about this, and you want to think about this after talking to your doctor. You know, I know a lot of people, let me put it this way, I, once again, I deal most, a lot with a lot of folks with Alzheimer's, and there are a kind of standard set of symptoms that people talk about when they're talking about Alzheimer's, and there are the cognitive ones, can't remember things, having trouble, you know, judgment isn't really that good, spatial problems. And then there are these emotional ones. Oh, they're really depressed, they're really angry, they're really anxious. I used to think that that was all part of the same pile and that everybody with Alzheimer's, those were all the symptoms. I no longer believe that from having dealt with some folks at some of these terrific memory care units and assisted livings, a guy named John Zeisel who uh, really developed the whole Hearthstone model, which is the assisted living, or the, uh, the memory care unit in, in Marlboro at, at, um, the, at New Horizons. I really believe that all of that stuff, all of the emotional stuff, is really not a primary symptom of Alzheimer's, but is really a secondary thing that happens. It's a, it's a person reacting to the way people are treating him or her because they have Alzheimer's. You know, yet again, how come you can't remember my name? I just told you that. How come you can't remember? Well, you know, if you have Alzheimer's and you just can't remember, that can make you feel very bad about yourself, <laughs> you know, and about the person who is talking to you. And so increasingly, there are folks who are trained. There's a term called learning to speak Alzheimer's that was written by a book, uh, by a woman whose book actually, th th this whole training has been adopted by the Alzheimer's Association, helping caregivers work with Alzheimer's patients. As a result of this, I think, People with Alzheimer's can live really very happy lives and meaningful lives, even though they don't remember your name, even though you're married to them and they don't remember your name. Why do they have to know your name in order to be able to be happy? You know? So the question is, if you're confused like that when you're talking to your person who's going to be the proxy, do you really want to say that by virtue of being confused, you want to know that you know, if you need a blood transfusion, you can't have it? You know? or that you're not going to be resuscitated if you need to be resuscitated. So you need to think about that stuff. You need to talk to your doctor about it. Um, and, and, and in that in set of instructions that you give to your proxy, you may want to include things like, I really want you to call a priest. I really want you to call a rabbi, especially because the kids probably don't go to mass or go to temple, right? They wouldn't necessarily think of this. But if it's important to you, then you want to do it, OK? Um, organ donations. The one exception <clears throat> to the rule that I just kind of said that, that, that your healthcare proxy um, that doesn't have to follow any instructions in your proxy is the organ donation law. 
The organ, I bet that many of you assume that if you want to make an organ donation or a donation of tissue or, or bone or anything to the entity that takes these things, which is called the New England Organ Bank, it's located in Waltham, there's actually a real place where your body goes and they kind of take pieces of you uh, if they need them for somebody else. I, I bet you assume that in order for you to, to have that happen, you need to sign up for it. You know, like there's that program and you, it's, on your, it's on your license, you know, and there's a registry thing. Well, that used to be the case. Um, but then the law got changed a couple of years ago. I think because they weren't getting enough donations. And by the way, it's, they're not especially, in most, ca most cases, interested in organs. They're is interested in tissue and bones. Tissue and bones. That's why people will say, well, why would they want anything that I have? I'm 90 years old, you know. But the answer is, you know, they don't especially want your eyes, you know, but they may want tissue and bone. So the law got changed, and now the way the law works is it is presumed when you die that your body can go to the New England Organ Bank unless you have, unless you or your proxy has said otherwise. Well, it, I, I explained that to someone. I was doing this presentation in Nantucket. I get to go to and I try to convince my, my, my partners that that's really a work trip when I go to Nantucket to do these presentations. So this lady said, well, but, well, so is, is there something I can sign, you know, to say that I don't want my, my organs to be donated? And so I emailed someone at the New England Organ Bank. And the answer was no. There's actually nothing you can sign, right? So you want to be sure when you die, if you don't want your organs to be donated, that there's somebody that's taking care of this. You, so you may want to put that instruction in your healthcare proxy. Why? Because while the healthcare proxy for all other purposes expires when you do, and the powers expire, for purposes of this law, the healthcare proxy is in control of your remains for purposes of deciding whether the body gets sent to the New England or Organ Bank. Right? So you may want to put right in your proxy uh, some language that says, I don't want my body to go to the New England Organ Bank, right? I know that this is a real concern to folks who are, who are Orthodox Christian uh, or uh, Orthodox Jews. I'm told that in both cases on religious grounds, there were real reasons why they don't want this to happen. So you want to have that covered. Um, you should also know that, your, that in terms of your remains, or in terms of the organ bank, if there is no proxy, the next person in charge of your body is the personal representative. That used to be called the executor or the executrix if you have a will, and after that it's the next of kin. Um, the MOLST form. I'm going to answer all questions when I'm done, so please write them down. Or if you're like, because if you're like me, you're going to forget the question, so write it down. Um, the MOLST form, Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Um, this form, as I had mentioned, is an expansion on the old DNR. It, but what, it tries to, what they try to do in the form is to cover a broader set of issues. So, that, so there's a box regarding whether you want resuscitation, right? What is resuscitation? Resuscitation is getting your heart to start after it has stopped, right? Um, a very unpleasant process. Because to get your heart to start after it has stopped, somebody has to press down on it through your ribs. And if you're an older person, they're probably going to be breaking all of your ribs along the way and try to press down on your heart and to see if they can kind of get it going. Uh, and that's important in, in because if your heart is stopped for a fairly short time, <laughs> you're not coming back. Um, you should be aware, though, I, I heard this figure from uh, Dr. Michelle Ricard, a wonderful, wonderful geriatrician who practices around here, that she had read a study that I think for people over 75, you're, no, you know, in general, you're, the success rate with CPR, the cardio, this resuscitation, is 25%. For people over 75, the likelihood of living 30 days, more than 30 days, if CPR had been, had been administered, is 5%. 5%. The reason why you want to kind of think about that is this is an incredibly painful thing, right? Which means for most people, it's an incredibly painful way to die. This is the last thing that you're going to experience before you leave, right? So you want to think about whether you really want to do this. The other thing about the MOLS form, just like the DNR, Technically, this document is not an order for you, from you saying what you want because medical, none of the medical people are supposed to listen to you in these cases. It's assisted suicide for them to listen to you, right? This is an order from the doctor, right? So the, the, the key signature on the most form is not yours but the doctor's signature. 
And the place that you would find the moles for them, you could find one at, at the, on the Department of Public Health website, but the place to find it is in your doctor's office. They all have them, right? And they want you, and, and DPH is encouraging people, doctors, to sit down with people and talk about this. By the way, I'm going to add one thing here. This is an ad. This is an ad. If you're older, how many people here are over 65? Oh my God, a lot, right? If you're older, you have to read this book. Uh, it is called Being Mortal. Being Mortal. Maybe you've heard of it already, and it's by a doctor named Atul Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E. I just read it. It is the most wonderful book, among other things, in talking about all of these issues. This guy, so he's in, in Indian, um, raised, his father was an in, immigrant from India, he was a surgeon. This guy is a surgeon at Brigham and Women's. He teaches at Harvard Medical School. He's talking about dealing with mortality and with though, in those last years, in our last years. The thing I always, I always say to people I like about doing elder law is that folks, in, my clients get it that they're going to die, right? Your kids don't think they're going to die. So most of them don't want to think that you're going to die. That's why they hate talking about this stuff, right? So, but most people, they get that. They don't fear that. What they fear is frailty. They fear three things. They fear cancer, they fear breaking things, and just being frail, and they fear dementia. And this book is all about those three things, and about figuring out from a doctor's perspective and your perspective, kind of dealing with those three things. So that's my ad. Um, um, where do you put the most form? Um, you, oh, you put it on the refrigerator on the refrigerator. The reason why um, I, do these interview, I do these cable shows, it, it's called Bergeron Briefs in some communities, and, and I interview the guy, one of the people who runs a big ambulance service around here, um, and he brought in his chief of operations, and they said, the way we train our people, and this is the way everybody trains their people, is, for this, you know, you go into a house and someone's on the floor, and you're the, you're the EMT, look at the refrigerator. See if there's a moles form on the refrigerator. If there's not, stop looking because you're busy. There's somebody on the floor. You've got to make some decisions, right? So even if you have this moles form, if it's not on the refrigerator, no one's going to find it, okay? Um, and even if you have said in your moles form that you don't want certain things to happen, your proxy can overrule that on the spot. Your proxy always retains all power to make medical decisions, even to overrule your old medical decisions, even if there is, in this case, a MOLST form. Um, decisions to make. We just talked about CPR. Do you really want cardiopulmonary resuscitation? Do you really want intubation? This is another one of the boxes that you can go through on the MOLST form. Intubation, what's that? It's putting a tube down your throat and into your lungs because it, it, so that if your lungs have stopped breathing, they can try to artificially cause them to breathe, right? Once again, not a pleasant thing, not a pleasant personal experience. So you, know, you may want to decide, eh, you know, in certain cases, I really don't want to go there, right? And but talk to your doctor about that. Thirdly, and I would say most important, if you are like Frank and Mary, and you want to die and be buried in the backyard, and oh, by the way, where you want to die is at home. You don't want to die in a hospital. You don't want to die in a nursing home. You want to die at home. Right? You're going to die. You want, it's a safe place. Right? One of the things you may want to put on your most form is do not hospitalize. That is actually one of the options on the form. Because if you go to the hospital, the hospital will save you mm -hmm. right? at all costs. Because first, and this is one of the things talked about in the Gawande book, because all doctors have been trained to save people. Right? And that's a big day. If they save someone, they don't want to let anybody go. Right? That's one. Two, I was on the board of the hospital here, right here at Marlboro Hospital for a number of years. And I know at our monthly meetings, one of the things we would get is a report on how many people died in our hospital that month. And that was an important figure because we have to report that to the Department of Public Health. And if too many people die in your hospital, next thing you know, there's an investigation and there's people coming out and boy, pretty soon I bet Medicare is going to start cutting your payments if too many people die in your hospital. So if you're in our hospital, we're going to get you home. Right? No matter what, no matter what, we're going to do everything we can to get you healthy enough so we can get you out the door. If you die at home, that's fine. But so the point is, if you really are intent on, on dying at home, you may not want to be going through what they're about to do to you at the hospital to kind of keep you going. Okay? So that's the most, and, and now, the reason why you want to go, that you don't, that you want the most form and that you want your health care proxy is that otherwise, 
The only way that someone can be named to make medical decisions for you is to go to probate court, get a guardian appointed, cost at least $10,000. If there's any dysfunctionality in your family, it's really going to come out through this process. I've seen that happen. So, and it's a very public process. You're going, you're fighting with your family members or your kids are in court, right? Not pleasant. So you want to avoid that. Power of attorney. Power of attorney. A couple of things. Uh, does it have to be witnessed? No. Does it have to be notarized? No, not in Massachusetts. The only time it has to be notarized is if you're giving the person whom you're naming, once again, not as your agent, the power of attorney is a, is, a, is a device through which you name someone as your agent or representative to sign legal things for you. People say, but wait a minute, I thought you were an attorney. Well, I'm a special kind. I'm an attorney at law. Uh, that means that I have been authorized by the court to represent you in front of a judge, right? But an attorney in general just means it's another name for an agent, right? So you don't have to wit have them witness or notarize. In all cases, though, forget about the witnesses, but always get them notarized. The reason for this, and for those of you who've been here before, you've heard me do this line. Um, but my daughter, who is now a lawyer, who, who now, this is a dad story, okay, who started practicing in January and works in the big time, works at Wilmer Hale, the old Hale and Door that combined with a firm in D.C., and so she's been in practice for three months, and last week she and her team went to the United States Supreme Court to argue a case. I have a very proud daughter who was involved in this case. So anyway, my daughter, when she was in high school, once gave me a t-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. So in the case of powers of attorney, the judge isn't like a real judge. It isn't a person who knows what the, whether it's valid, the power of attorney is valid. It's like the bank teller, right? Because your child is going to the bank saying, Oh, you know, this is my dad's power of attorney and I want to, you know, sign these checks or I want to take out some money. Or it's the insurance guy that your son is calling to deal with this stuff. At, at which point the bank teller looks at this document and has to decide, is this a valid power of attorney? Right? So you want this document to look as legal as possible. You want it to look really official. And a big piece of this, I'm always amazed, is people will see a document that has a notarization and a seal, of one of those raised seals, they're like, whoa, that must be an official legal document. So that's why you want to get it notarized, not because it's in any way otherwise important. Um, if the power of attorney, if you want to allow that person who is your attorney or your agent to gift things on your behalf uh, or to deal with himself or herself, to gift things to himself or herself, that has to be specified in the power of attorney. And we're going to talk about why that's important in a little while. Uh, also, you don't have to just name one person in your attorney. Uh, in the healthcare proxy, you can only name one person at a time because the law is meant to make sure that your doctor only has to listen to one person. He doesn't want to hear fighting, right? Your power of attorney, you can name several people jointly and severally. Jointly and severally, if it's just jointly, that means they all have to sign at the same time. Jointly and severally means any one of them can, without, the, without the others can act on your behalf. If you're Frank and Mary, and once again, you're getting older and you want to make sure that if there's an emergency, one of the kids can handle it. You may want to name the spouse and also that designated daughter or that designated child jointly and severally. That way, if your spouse is around and feeling fine, they can take care of it. But otherwise, the child can take care of that. Okay? Uh, once again, the reason for it, otherwise, otherwise, if someone has to be appointed to make these kinds of legal decisions for you, it means a conservatorship, whole separate process from the guardianship. So if you haven't done either document, the proxy or the power of attorney, you're probably going to spend about $20,000 going to court because each one of these is going to cost you about 10 and there are all those other bad things. So that's, that's that. So about asset protection. We're going to talk a little bit about this. This gets more significant the older you get, but people talk to me about this and they'll say, you know, I heard on the radio I heard on the radio, I, you know, if I want to make sure that I'm safe if I go to a nursing home, I have to give away what I have and I have to wait five years and I have to do an irrevocable trust and all this stuff. Now, the answer for that, to that, if you're Frank and Mary, is no, is no. And the reason for that is, this is MassHealth 101. <clears throat> MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Medicaid as opposed to Medicare. Medicare is health insurance for the old. You get it by virtue of just being us, right? Medicaid is health insurance for the poor. You get it by virtue of being poor, uh, according to their definitions. Now, remember, those are Frank and Mary's assets, and those are, that's their income. So how many of you think that if, if Mary starts feeling crummy and has to go to a nursing home, that Frank's going to need to spend down some of those assets before 
Mass Health will pay for the nursing home care. Anybody think you've got to do that? Oh, then maybe that's because you've been here before, because the answer is you don't. Medicare, by the way, will cover as many of, as 100 days of nursing home care. You've probably all heard this. As long as you get to the nursing home via a hospital, as long as you were admitted to the hospital, not just staying at the hospital, but admitted to the hospital for at least three days, and then get discharged to a nursing home for rehab, then Medicare will cover as many as 100 days at the nursing home while you're getting better. At the end of the 100 days, even if you still need to get better some more, that's going to stop. And either you're going to be paying privately or Medicaid, in this case MassHealth, will pay. So, for Mary to qualify for nursing home care, she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. But whoa, she has a lot more than that, right? But the main thing to know is that Frank, as the spouse at home, can own the home as long as its, its equity is less than 820, I think it's $820,000 now, just went up a little bit, um, can have cash or cash equivalent assets, that is this other stuff, equal to $119,220. Don't ask me where these numbers come from. They come from the sky. It's the federal government. Um, and can have unlimited income, most important, can have unlimited income. So in this situation, if Mary goes to the nursing home, all she has to do is simply transfer all of her assets to Frank. And by the way, you've all heard that term, oh, the look-back period, right? You all know this look-back period. There is no look-back period regarding transfers to, between spouses. So Mary goes to the nursing home today. She can transfer all of her assets to Frank tomorrow, which means the house is safe and quite a bit of cash is safe. But he's still over, right, because he's got more than $119,220. So all he has to do then, the next day, is take the amount that's over that magic number and go buy an annuity, a certain kind of annuity. The annuity has to be a, for a term, it has to pay, for, pay monthly payments, and the term has to be shorter of, than his actuarial life expectancy. By the way, if Frank is 87 years old, his life expectancy is negative five years. No, it's five years. His life expectancy is five years. People are always amazed by this. They say, I thought a life expectancy was like 82 or something. Well, when you're, if you were zero today, then that would be about your life expectancy. If you were 100 today, your life expectancy would be a year and a half, interestingly. So if Frank buys that annuity with whatever amount, so what he should do is take, take say, keep $100,000 in his account, take the rest of it, the other, uh, what is it, $225,000, buy an annuity as long as it calls for monthly payments over a term that's shorter than his life expectancy. The purchase of the annuity is a legitimate conversion from an asset, which is countable, to an income stream, which is not, because he's allowed to have infinite income. Remember, I mentioned that earlier. So in this case, if either of them needs nursing home care, while they're both alive, everything's fine. Everything's fine. They didn't need to do any advanced planning. They didn't need to give their assets away to their kids, wait five years, none of that stuff, right? The only thing that you got to make sure doesn't happen is you got to make sure, so you got to make sure, and so that, that Frank doesn't die. Because of course, if Frank dies and their current plan is in effect, which is if I die, I want everything to go to my spouse, well, now Mary's got a problem, right? Because now Mary's got all these assets and she can only have, have, have $2,000 in assets. So she's going to have to spend down all of the cash and then they'll qualify her because the house is an accountable asset, but they'll put a lien on the house so that MassHealth will get reimbursed after her death. So the question is, how do Frank and Mary avoid that risk? Because as we said, Frank's big concern is to make sure Mary is safe. And Mary's big concern is to make sure that Frank is safe. They, they avoid that by simply changing their wills. This goes back to the reference I made earlier to trusts in wills. If Frank's will says, upon my death, everything that I own is going to be held in trust for the benefit of my spouse, Mary, instead of going to her directly, even though my kids are the trustees, even though they have the discretion to distribute as much of the money to Mary as they want or to spend any money on, their behalf, on her behalf, if Frank dies owning all these assets, they're all immediately safe. Mary can stay on Mass Health, or if she wasn't on it yet, she can qualify later. All the assets can be immediately safe. So the one thing that I do tell people younger people who are talking to me is I say, you don't need to do anything ahead of time to transfer your assets out, wait five years, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and as long as you're both alive, everything's going to be fine. So don't die. Don't die, right? Or alternatively, make sure that these wills are in place 
with those trust provisions so that if one of you gets sick, we can transfer all the assets to the one who's gotten sick so that when he dies, the spouse is going to be safe. And by the way, people will inevitably say, but what if I just drop dead? Well, you know, remember when we were growing up, a lot of people would drop dead. You know, you'd always read, oh, somebody had a heart attack and they died, or somebody had a stroke and they died. No, it never happens now. They always save you, right? The ambulance comes, they do CPR, they get you to the hospital. Just about nobody just dies, right? So if you've got this plan in place, you probably don't have to, you know, kind of pick ahead of time and say, which one of us is going to die first? You're probably going to know. Somebody's going to get sick and you can transfer the assets to them the day before they die. We've literally done that the day before somebody died. I had a woman who talked to me a couple of months ago and she was, she was all distraught. She's got one daughter, she's dying of cancer, the husband's got early stage Alzheimer's. What do I do? They got about a million dollars in assets. I said, this is okay, we're gonna transfer everything to you. She's in the hospital. She's still saying though, so she can still sign something. We're going to change your will to say that upon your death, everything is going to go in trust for the benefit of your husband, and then it's all going to be fine, which is what we did. And she died three weeks later, and the husband's now in a nursing home, and the assets are all safe. So you don't have to do this kind of long-term, five-year planning. Um, that's that. So if Frank has died, though, and Mary hasn't done any of this planning, well, then Mary has more of a problem. In that case, she does have to do... She, you know, she, those are her assets. If she wants to save any of them, she's going to have to transfer them out to somebody and wait five years. Typically, in her situation, what she would do is she would transfer out the house. She would often transfer the house to the kids, but keep a so-called life estate in the house so that she can not have to worry that the kids are going to throw her out. That's a constant worry, I hear, because they've all heard stories, and then they're true. I've, known, I've seen those stories where the kids really do throw you out. So you don't want to... Give them the house and not really be able to live there until you die. So you just keep a life estate. An alternative to that is to transfer the, 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 this. And what you're giving them, by the way, when you keep the life estate, you're giving them something called a remainder interest in the property so that you own the life estate, that is total ownership until the moment of your death, together with the responsibility for paying the taxes and the insurance and all the other stuff, the ability to rent out the house if you want to, and the ability to throw out your kids if they're living with you. You can just throw them out, right? But then upon your death, that interest evaporates, leaving the, the kids, in that case, with the re so-called remainder interest so that they can sell the house, right? Um, there may be reasons to do an irrevocable trust instead of doing that, but that, that's actually the, that's often the simplest. One of the reasons for doing a trust is if you think that upon your death, the kids themselves might argue about how to, what to do with the house, right? Or that one of the kids might die before you do. Well, sometimes you'd want to set up a trust to deal with those issues, to make sure that it is figured out what happens to the house after you die. So um, that's Mary, uh, and I think I already talked about that. Um, there's an, another reason for doing the, the retained life estate but transferring to an irrevocable trust is the only problem with just giving it to your kids and keeping the life estate for yourself is that if you don't go to a nursing home and don't hold the house until you die but sell it while you're alive, having given your kids an interest in the house reduces your capital gains exemption. That gets a little more complicated than I want to do today, but you, you should just be kind of, when you're talking to your lawyer about it, he'll tell you, he or she will tell you all about that. Now, a few words about long-term care insurance. Frank and Mary will often call me or will be talking to me about their plan and say, they're still young enough because they're under 70 because you're not going to get long-term care insurance anymore if you're over 70. They're, you're on, under 70. Should I buy long-term care insurance? Um, and my answer to them will be, well, actually, if the purpose of buying the long-term care insurance is you're Frank and Mary and you want to make sure you're safe while you're alive, well, then the answer is no, because you don't need it. You don't need it, because you can protect all your assets if one of you needs nursing home care. And if one of you has died and you've got the will with the trust in place, then the other spouse can go to the nursing home. So you don't need, ironically, you don't need long-term care insurance for what it was originally designed for, which was to pay the nursing home. And if you were buying it for that purpose, the policy would be incredibly expensive because the good nursing homes now, the best one is around here is, I would say, is St. Patrick's in Framingham, and that's about $400 a day. So that's $12,000 a month, or about $150 a year. So it's going to take a big long-term care insurance policy to cover that. <coughs> but you don't need it. Ironically, though, the reason why you may want to get it is because is most long-term care insurance policies now 
have a provision that says that for whatever number of days you're eligible for the policy, you can also use that money to buy home care, to buy home care, so that if you want to stay at home, instead of going to a nursing home, the care is going to be available to you. And, and the reason why I mentioned that, I didn't, go through this in, in, I didn't go through this when we were talking about MassHealth. There is also a program at MassHealth to keep people who would otherwise be eligible for nursing home care at home. It's called the Frail Elder Waiver. Uh, and, and, if you, and if you qualify for that, and Mary and Frank would, then MassHealth will basically pay for whatever number of home care hours you need, up to about 40 or 50, uh, to stay out of the nursing home. But if you needed more than that number of hours to stay out, and boy, I'll tell you, every one of my clients will say, without question, their biggest goal is to never go to a nursing home if they don't have to, right? To the extent that you needed more than that number of hours, you may be able to, that, that long-term care insurance policy may, may be able to help you top that number out so that you'd be able to get enough hours to stay home. The other thing about the long-term care insurance policies is that mass, if Mass Health is paying for the home care workers to be at home with you, they, they hire from a, from a list of vendors, which is not every vendor, because they don't pay as well as, as in the private sector. So you may be dissatisfied with the home care workers that you're getting and not have some other options. Um, whereas the long-term care insurance policy may give you more options because you're able to pay people, not surprisingly, more money. Uh, a couple of things to be considered if you're buying a long-term care insurance policy. You want to, I, I hate to say it, but you got to read the fine print. Like you need to know things like, what does your policy define as sick, right? How, what do you need in order to get long-term care? Many of the older policies will say that you need to require assistance with one or more of the activities of daily living. The activities of daily living, there are five of them. They are, this is always my test, they are dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, and transferring. Transferring means getting up out of a chair, getting across the room, and sitting down. Now, if your long-term now, if your long-term care insurance policy says you need one of those, and if you've simply got a spouse who is at home who's got Alzheimer's or some other disease that is causing dementia, and you just need someone to be there, right? Well, unless you can show that they need help with one of those five, you, the long-term care insurance policy doesn't kick in, right? But that may be exactly why you want them, right? Is because you've got a spouse who's at home and's got dementia and doesn't need a lot of medical care. So you want to read what the policy says. Um, you want to know who the policy says you can hire. There are many policies that say you can only hire somebody from a so-called certified agency. Well, the interesting thing about that in Massachusetts, and this is coming up, is there are no certified agencies. Massachusetts does not have an entity, a government entity, that certifies uh, home care agencies. Isn't that interesting? Uh, well, not tremendously interesting, because it means when you're shopping for a home care agency, you really have to pay attention, because there's no place you can look I mean, I, have a, I know a guy, I mean, home care agencies, there's some wonderful ones. There's some wonderful ones around here. There's a place called um, Right at Home in Westboro. Terrific. Home Instead in Northboro. Terrific. Right here in, in Southboro, there's a group called uh, Around the Clock Home Care. Privately owned, not a franchise. Terrific, right? But, uh, but I, I met one guy recently who had just started a, ho a home care agency in, in uh, Worcester. And what was his background? Well, he was a mortgage broker. But that business collapsed, and so now he's in the home care business. Well, what does he know about home care? Nothing. What does he need to know? Nothing. He doesn't need certification, right? So anyway, you, if, if you've got a policy that says you can only hire certified per people, that means you may have that issue in Massachusetts, and also that means you can't hire the lady down the street that you really wanted to hire because they're good friends of the family and all that jazz. So you want to know that. Um, you want to know also if extra payments, if extra payments are allowed. If, if you want to hire somebody special, but they're charging more than the home care policy will pay, are you allowed to pay the extra? Because some policies will say no. They'll say you're only allowed to pay what is in the policy. So uh, now a couple of other things. Estate tax avoidance. This is, this is, this is, a, this is very brief. Um, if, if, you, if you're Frank and Mary um, and you're worried about federal estate taxes, don't be too worried. Um, you need to have a total estate of about $10.8 million now in order to be worried about the federal estate tax. On the other hand, on the other hand, Massachusetts, if you die, if you die leaving everything to your spouse, it doesn't count because there's a 100% marital deduction. But if Frank's dead and Mary dies, 
in her case, she's still safe. But if her estate is more, if her taxable estate is more than a million dollars, there will be an estate tax. The marginal rate on the first dollar over a million dollars is 40%. So if she has an estate of one million one dollar, she's going to pay 40 cents in estate tax. If she has an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, she's going to pay about forty thousand dollars in estate tax. It's actually a little bit less than that, but but not much. Now the estate tax, once you get to a million one, goes down. The, the marginal rate goes down from 40% to like six or seven, it's about seven percent. It's very low. But the point is, there is a tax, you should be aware of that. And if you're, and if you're Frank and Mary, and you have total assets of less than $2 million, you can basically, just by doing some paper shuffling, right, and some a asset restructuring, structure things so that when the second one dies, there'll be no estate tax. You can eliminate the estate tax on estates where the total is up to $2 million. But you've got to talk to your lawyer about that. It's just, it's all paper. This is just, this is one of the things that lawyers can just save you some money. Um, and when you're doing that kind of plan, you can also combine that in terms of the trusts that are involved with the asset protection stuff that I had talked about earlier. That's everything about estate taxes. Finally, avoiding probate. People will often say, I just don't want to go to probate. Well, there are some fairly simple ways to do that. Um, like in the case of Frank and Mary, in the case of Frank and Mary, if one of them dies, there would be no probate. The reason is because assets that are jointly held uh, legally, if you own something jointly with someone, that means you each own 100% of the asset. You don't each own half, right? So when you die, your interest simply evaporates, poof, and the other person now is the sole owner of 100% of the asset. So often people will, a uh, spouse will call me, oh, my husband just died, I need, to, I, need to, I need to do a new deed. And the answer to that is, well, actually, no, you don't, because the de if your deed said that you and your husband own the property jointly with rights of survivorship, then upon his death, his interest simply evaporated, and now you're the sole owner. So all you need to do is file a death certificate in the Registry of Deeds to show that he is in fact dead, and you can now establish for title purposes that you're the sole owner of the property. So one way to do it is jointly held assets. Or if you're just married because Frank is dead, then you may want to consider putting your kids on your bank accounts with you, right? If you're comfortable with that. Now remember, if someone's a joint a hold, account holder with you on your bank account, even before you're dead, they can go get the money and take it out, right? So you gotta trust your kids. But if you're okay with that, that's an easy way to do it. Another alternative, once again, re regarding the house, regarding the house is, I admit, as I had mentioned before, you can transfer to your children a so-called remainder interest in the house and keep a life estate. The effect of that is you do keep complete control of the house while you're alive, but upon your death, poof, your interest evaporates, the kids become the sole owners of the house. So you can, you can also use revocable trusts. Um, that's the, the next to joint ownership, the most common way of doing this. If you're Frank and Mary, you could take your house, even if you had other stuff in joint names with your kids or whatever, you could take your house, create a trust which is revocable, revocable and amendable, so you keep complete control over it. Name yourselves as the trustees, Frank and Mary, for the benefit of myself, ourselves and our children. And you would say, in, right in the trust, we can revoke this at any time, we can take the property back, we can amend it, we can do whatever we want. And then you would say, when one of us dies, the other one remains as the sole trustee, the sole person in legal control of everything, and that person retains the power to amend or to revoke or whatever. So, in terms of what's happening on the ground, that's the same thing as if you owned it jointly, right? But then you'd also say that when the second of the two of us dies, I'm naming whoever was going to be your personal representative under your will, the designated daughter or the son, whoever, right, as the successor trustee. And if you've done it that way, when the second spouse dies, the child immediately steps into your shoes as a successor trustee and can distribute immediately whatever's in the trust. So it never goes through probate. The other reason to kind of avoid probate because of just the legal costs and stuff is that once property is gone through, going through probate, it's also subject to the claims of your creditors. So if you have any creditors, they take priority over any distributions to your kids. Whereas if you do this, upon the death of the second of the two of you to die, what other personal bills you had evaporate, the trustee becomes the sole owner of the property, and, you, and you've nailed the creditors. Um, personal property, finally. The only reason technically, for a lot of people, once you've got this joint stuff set up and done this other stuff, that you would need to go through probate is if you had tangible personal property. What's that? That's everything that you've got in the house, right? 
It includes your car, by the way. Um, but it's, it's everything that isn't real estate. Real estate, there are three kinds of property in the world. There's real property, which is land, structures permanently attached to land, fixtures permanently attached to structures. So that for example, so for example, your light fixtures in your house, if they're right in the wall, are, are, you know, are, are, are real estate. Technically, they're part of the real estate. If they're plugged in, they're not. They're tangible personal property. So people will say, well, what, how do I deal with that? Well, typically what happens when you die is your kids just divide stuff up, you know? And they kind of sit around and they figure out how to divide things up. Now, if you're concerned, and, and if that's what they're going to do with your tangible personal property, then there's no re reason for them to go through probate, because the point of probate is to determine who owns something after you die. But if they're just going to divide it up, who cares, right? There, no one needs to figure out who's going to own it after you die. If you think there's going to be an issue, if you think there's going to be an issue, um, it, actually this re applies to two things. If you think there's going to be an issue on the tangible personal property, I have seen things get fought over, stupid things, right? Then what you can do is you can just do a, do a will, right? And in your will say, um, if I've made out a list regarding who's supposed to get my tangible personal property, everyone's supposed to abide by that list. And then you write out your list, right? Or in your will you say, upon my death, everything's going to get divided up as far as, as the kids agree, or if they can't agree, I'm going to name a personal representative, one of the kids, he's, he or she's going to do it, right? So you have this will, and it says how you want to deal with your personal property. So now you die. And now your kids have got all this tangible personal property. There's no other reason to probate the will, but they've got all this personal property and they start arguing about it, right? And so now they've got two choices. Either they can resolve the argument and divide up the personal property, or they can go through the probate process, wait a year, spend $10,000, and then divide up the personal property in the very same way. So in that case, what are they going to do? They're going to just leave the will parked there, right? And they're going to divide up the property. The only other reason that I'm going to mention to do a will, if you're otherwise trying to avoid probate, is this joint ownership problem. And that is the single biggest um, source of litigation in probate estates is the argument between the personal representative who was under the will and the joint owner, the surviving joint owner of a bank account or a house, right? But of, most often of a bank account, right? And, and it, now, for legal purposes, if you've named a daughter or a son or a niece or a nephew, if you put them on jointly with you on your bank account, presumptively, the legal presumption is when you die, they become the owner of the, the account. But that presumption is reversible, right? If the personal representative under the estate goes into probate court and says, you know, Aunt, you know, aunt so-and-so only did that as a convenience. She was getting old, and this, and, you know, and this niece, my cousin, whom I never liked, you know, was taking care of the aunt, and she was just doing it so she could get the money. You know? But my aunt didn't want her to get the money. She wanted the money to go to everybody. That's why she said all the nieces and nephews are in the will. Now, I have had several versions of that exact case, that exact case. I had one where the aunt had, it was a $200,000 joint account, and the aunt said to the niece, now don't tell any, we're not going to tell anybody about this, you know, because I don't want any of the others to feel offended that I'm not dividing things up. Well, you know, as if it's not going to come out, you know, that there, as if no one knew that there was two, some money sitting around someplace. And it ended up being a big probate fight, and they spent, between the, two, the whole families, they spent $100,000 on litigation, right? Now, it may have been when the aunt died that she really wanted this one daughter to get all the money. Or it may have been when the aunt died that she really wanted to divide it up. What you can be sure is that she didn't want $100,000 to go to the lawyers, right? Now, the way you resolve that is by simply having a will, and in your will, very simple will, but you say, right in the will, as to all jointly held accounts at the time of my death, it is my desire that those accounts go to the surviving joint owner. Or as to one particular account, it's my desire that they go to the surviving joint owner. Or it's my desire regarding these joint accounts that things be divided up equally. I often have people say, you know, I've got my daughter on all these accounts because I know she's going to do the right thing when I die. You know, she's going to divide up among all the brothers and sisters. And that's great, you know, and I hope she does. You know, but if she doesn't, now what? So just like with the tangible personal property, if it's in the will, if it's in the will, when I die, I want, it, I want any accounts that were jointly held to be divided equally among the kids, 
right? And now she dies, and now there's this will that says that. Now the daughter who, got the, who, who, who was the surviving Joan owner has a choice. She can, either, she can either divide up the money among all the kids, or she can have one of them file in probate knowing that once the will is approved, she's going to have to divide it up among all the kids because that's what the will says. So what's she going to do? She's just going to divide it up. So in those cases, having the will itself keeps you out of the probate court. Uh, we, we just did that. Finally, um, so if, if, you, if you didn't get all this, we covered a lot of material, or if you know somebody that you think should see this, um, Frank and Mary have a YouTube channel. It's called Elder Law Frank and Mary. It's where all of these presentations go. And so you can see this or other programs about this stuff. And remember, the goal of all of this stuff is, that's supposed to say peace of mind, not just peace of. The goal of all of this stuff is to, is to, get, is to sleep well at night. So hopefully this has helped you with some of those things. Thank you very, very much. And I hope you come for Elder Law 102. Thank you. Thank you.